Three weeks ago today, the world watched in horror as an angry, violent mob attacked the heart of US democracy, disputing the results of the presidential election that declared Joe Biden the winner. It didn't take long to identify who was to blame for inciting the violence and those who carried it out. But what has been debated since January 6 is what society should make of these online platforms that first enabled, live streamed, shared, then condemned the chaos that occurred. Social media enabled the mobilization of radicalists who stormed the Capitol Hill, yet it was also through social media that investigators were quickly able to track down the offenders and hold them accountable. The platforms were hit with criticism from both sides for not rooting out harmful content ahead of time, while some blamed them for restrict restricting the freedom of speech. And as this debate continues, today we address some of the fundamental questions being asked. And for this, we're joined by Joshua Tucker, Professor of Politics and Co-Director of the Centre for Social Media and Politics at New York University. We also have John Nilsson Wright, Senior Lecturer of Modern Japanese Studies at the University of Cambridge. Very warm welcome to you both. Thank you again for joining us. And well, let's go straight into the discussion, uh, starting with you, Dr. Tucker. Now, were you surprised by the insurrection that took place on Capitol Hill, which was largely mobilised through social media, a phenomenon that you've been, um, social media, of course, which you've been studying for a very long time. Um, how does social media influence political polarisation and the sense of tribalism? And is there a remedy to all of this? So thanks so much for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I must say, so to answer your question in the beginning, as an American, of course, I was surprised. I, I never thought I would see uh, an insurrection in the US Capitol in my lifetime. I certainly never thought I would see a Confederate flag being paraded through the halls of the US Capitol. So it was it was very hard to, to take, and it was super surprising. But as an analyst, I want to make a, a clear point here, which is that the book is not closed on whether or not social media itself causes political polarization, or whether these are deeper, larger societal forces going on that are driving political polarization. So there are lots of reasons to think why social media might enhance political polarization. Uh, it makes it much easier to find people who are similar to you. If you hold extremist views, like the people who participated in the videos that were being shown right now, if you hold extremist views, you may not know many people in your neighborhood or community who hold similar views, but you can find those people on the internet. And as we saw, you can plan coordinated activities. Um, also, it's been long stated that algorithms on social media are designed to prioritize content that keeps people on the platform. So it, they try to show people content they want to see. Again, if you have extremist views, that means exposing you potentially to more extremist content. But to be very clear, there are also reasons to think that this is not necessarily the case. Um, for example, it's not particularly clear that everyone's offline networks are more diverse, in fact, than their online networks. In fact, for a lot of people, their offline networks, the people they see in the course of their daily life in their neighborhoods where they live, might be much more of an echo chamber than what they encounter on social media. Um, now, it's possible that when, for some people, Social media is where they encounter people with the most diverse views. Now, it might be the case that you don't like those people when you encounter them, but it doesn't, but it has to be very careful about signaling out social media as the place where people only hear like minded information. And in fact, at the Center for Social Media and Politics at NYU, we ran a study in Bosnia where we took people off of social media during a particularly important time commemorating ethnic violence. And what we found was the people who went off social media actually had more negative views of ethnic outgroups than the people who stayed on social media. Right, so there's still a lot of um, debate that needs to take place, a lot of discussion, and then look into if social media is really causing um, societal division or whether there are deeper uh, roots to it. And Dr. Nielsen writes, now Trump loyalists, they've uh, claimed that banning the former president from Twitter, Facebook and the like is a violation of the country's First Amendment. What do you think about this argument? And do you think this perhaps indicates that there's a general lack of understanding of what free speech actually is and what really makes up a uh, healthy de democracy? I'm not convinced by the argument. I think one of the troubling issues and perhaps one of the other factors are um, in terms of understanding this increased polarization that we've seen, not just in the United States, but in many different um, polities. In my own country, in the United Kingdom, the debate over Brexit has uh, reflected a similar polarization, maybe in part the result of questioning the accuracy and reliability of um, information. And of course, we've seen, importantly, demagogic leaders like former President Trump 
willing to engage in the manipulation of information, uh, routinely lying, presenting information that is questionable at the very least, and in many situations is downright manipulative. And so I think social media companies have been faced with a dilemma. How do they manage um, information which is seen to be patently unreliable? And we saw, of course, before the events of that troubling storming of the Capitol, efforts by both Facebook and Twitter to try and um, highlight the extent to which leaders like Trump were distorting the factual record. The problem here, of course, has been the charge of incitement. Donald Trump, through his inflammatory language, actually was um, encouraging those demonstrators to take violent action. And it's the familiar argument that you know, the First Amendment defends your right to, to say what you feel, but it doesn't legitimize shouting fire in a crowded theater, which is essentially, of course, what the president uh, has done, or the former president, rather. And I think that was a powerful argument in favor of deciding to uh, impose this ban. The problem with that approach, of course, and it's been an argument that um, political protesters in countries like Russia and elsewhere have noted, I think, understandably, is that by taking this action, some of these Western social media companies may have legitimized authoritarian governments, whether in Russia or China, that might be tempted to restrict the freedom of speech of some of their own citizens. And that's obviously a concern when one thinks about the larger ramifications. However, that being said, I think um, both Facebook and Twitter, in a sense, had little choice but to take action to demonstrate their opposition to the action of the former president. And now, Dr. Tucker, despite uh, the likes of Facebook and Twitter posting warnings indicating that certain inflammatory messages or posts might be misleading, some people still refuse to believe the facts about the election and they blamed many things like the deep state, fake news media and even until um, Joe Biden's inauguration actually took place, they were convinced that federal agents would start arresting Mr. Biden, Mr. Obama and Mrs. Pelosi. Some of them later posted that they'd been um, fooled by this um, fake source of information. But why are people so essentially bad at discerning what they should or probably shouldn't believe? So we could talk about that for a long time, but let me let me give you sort of two things to put on the table here. The first is what we call in, in social science is motivated reasoning. Often people are want to believe something is true, and so they interpret particular facts that they encounter through a lens that's colored by their existing uh, partisan proclivities. And so that's one reason why people, you know, you don't want to believe that President Trump lost the election. Suddenly people give you information. It's false information, but it tells a story whereby he didn't actually lose the election. And so you want to believe it. And, and so then you start to believe it a little bit more. So that's one reason. The second thing is, is actually very, it can be quite difficult in the internet era where people are suddenly being exposed to so much more information about news, about politics than they ever were in the pre that era and where that information comes from all these sort of unvetted sources it's difficult for people to actually figure out what's true or not we've been running a huge study at the center for social media and politics whereby we were taking popular news stories that had appeared in the past 24 hours and sending them out to large groups of average americans to act ask them to assess whether they were false or misleading or whether they were true or whether they couldn't determine. Uh, we also simultaneously sent these articles to professional fact checkers to get the sort of correct answer about whether they were true or false. And what we found was that while people were pretty good at identifying false, uh, at identifying true news stories, for the articles that our professional fact checkers labeled as false, fully a third of our ordinary respondents thought that those articles were true. And in fact, uh, just a similar number correctly thought they were false, so a third of them thinking they were false. So, you know, so it can be very difficult for people to identify in the context of internet news what's true and what's not. I will say you mentioned the warnings that Twitter put on these, that put on some of these tweets. We did a little bit of work tracking what happened after those warnings, and they did seem to be, with the possible exception of President Trump's, uh, former President Trump's tweets at the time, they did seem to be effective at slowing down the spread a little bit, especially when they put on these so-called hard warnings. We have a brand new study, which we're just uh, finishing finding, you know, looking at results from right now, but where we found that actually using com a commercial product that puts a warning over news that says this warning, this news comes from a reliable source or a non-reliable source, that that actually does have a positive effect on people's ability to correctly discern whether the information is true or not, but also in terms of their behavior and sharing that and where they go to sort of visit what websites they go to afterwards. So perhaps there are some potential solutions on the horizon. Well, it's 
good to hear that there are some solutions and some progress being made, but still incredibly sad that we now have to start labelling news to discern what is right and what is false. And well, Dr. Nielsen writes, while Twitter and Facebook and other social media firms, they started taking action and they decided to remove Trump's account from their platforms, many said that this was really locking the stable gate after the horses bolted. And not to mention that the bans came after Biden was confirmed president-elect. Are social media's companies now so powerful that they can influence democracy with their control over the flow of information and all this advertising? And in that sense, should they be trusted to self-regulate? I think it's a very difficult argument. Um, given the power of organizations like Facebook and Twitter, it's a legitimate question to ask. I think we do have to be wary of assuming that organizations should be able to make their own policy. Um, obviously, people make political judgments. Um, and depending on which side of the issue you're, you're, you come down on politically, you may be supportive or critical of the actions of these very large companies. I think the efforts on the part of Congress and legislators across the world to try and regulate the way these large organizations operate is sensible. But of course, there's a very important debate to be said about how far these organizations can be regulated and in what way. Uh, the lack of a diversification of alternative social media, I think, is a, is a problem. But all of this is happening in a context where I think the question of how public opinion reacts to perceived um, uh, facts, I think it's not only the question of the reliability of information, but the way in which information is filtered and interpreted. If we take, for example, the debate over Brexit, it was um, widely reported that many of the individuals who ended up voting in support of Britain leaving the European Union believed strongly that immigration was taking away jobs from British workers. And yet the, the information itself um, suggested otherwise, and that the challenge of immigration was not as gra grave as people had assumed. It's also perhaps important to recognize that in some instances, people are making decisions not based on what one might define as their rational economic self-interest, uh, as has often been assumed in the past by some social scientists, but sometimes driven by emotional uh, issues and emotional concerns, that people make moral judgments quickly on the basis of their gut, their instinct, rather than a reasoned analysis of the facts as they're seen, or in fact, as the facts as they are. Um, this is something that is, I think, much harder to control, particularly when you have individual politicians who seek to exploit those that politics of emotion which has become arguably much more important in shaping the way not only people make decisions but align themselves with other groups within society and the loyalties that shape their decisions in supporting particular political actors or political parties and on that note dr nelson right let me ask you a follow-up question now uh, what do you think really should be done to stop malign actors from really exerting political influence on social media whether it's uh, domestic politicians in the u.s like people like Ted Cruz or trolls in Russia and um, even though, some, as some say, the royal family in Saudi Arabia. Should there be consequences and even sanctions on domestic and perhaps an international scale? Well, I think this is something that all, all open societies need to take very seriously. And there hasn't really, I think, been a serious and focused debate by, um, by those open societies in terms of how best to protect what is, after all, as we saw in the United States just a few weeks ago, in some cases a very fragile institution. Protecting your home institutions against foreign attacks through cyber attacks and efforts by malign actors, particularly um, hostile national governments, authoritarian governments, whether it's Russia or China, to interfere in elections needs to be something that states take very, very seriously. Uh, and we can have a long debate about the different techniques that could be used to, uh, to deal with that threat. When it comes to the domestic challenge, you mentioned politicians like Ted Cruz who are prepared, I would say, from my vantage point, to willfully misinterpret information to suit their own political agenda. I think it's incumbent on other politicians to speak out uh, and to, to be critical of the, their political colleagues when they engage in this sort of behavior. We're about to see a second impeachment trial in the United States. This will be an opportunity through the documentary record to actually present to the American public the facts as they, I think, are, are perceived by objective uh, observers, whether it's politicians or social scientists or, for that matter, journalists. Um, there are very important principles that free societies, free open societies need to maintain. 
they need to be protected. Alongside that is the importance of maintaining the transparency of political democratic institutions, institutions which are themselves under attack by unscrupulous politicians. So, well, this issue really isn't going to go away any soon, and I'm afraid today we've run out of time, but obviously this debate will continue, and hopefully we can turn to both of you again for your insights as we see more developments. And Well, that was uh, Professor Joshua Tucker at New York University and Professor John Nilsson Wright at the University of Cambridge. Thank you both so much for your time. Thank, thank you very much. And to our viewers, as always, thank you for watching.